Greetings. My name is Robin Walker. I'm Director of Education of our company, Black History Studies Limited. And what I'm going to talk about, the topic areas are going to be, why is it important that we do sessions like this? Before the era of the slave traders, and finally, about our book. The book is called Before the Slave Trade. Okay, why is it important that we do sessions like this? Well, the Jamaica Observer published a controversial article by Michael Dingwall entitled Slavery Was Good for the Black Man. Now you might think something like this would have been written years ago, but actually the article was published 9th of August 2008. And I've reproduced here the first two paragraphs to encourage serious thought. This is what he wrote. As we celebrate emancipation and independence, we are being reminded of the horrors of slavery. According to our leaders, academics, and others, slavery was the worst institution ever created. However, while it is popular for most to agree with this claim, I beg to disagree, says this Jamaican journalist. Indeed, contrary to the belief that slavery was bad for us blacks, I believe that slavery was good for us. Have we ever stopped to consider where we, black people, especially those of us in the West, would be right now if it weren't for the Atlantic slave trade? What state do you think black Africa would be in today? Do you think we would have been better off without slavery? I don't think so. Okay, that raises an important question. What do you think? What do you think about what this journalist has to say? All right, now let me say what I think. I'm going to address a key question. What was Africa like before the slave trade? Okay, the kidnapping and mass enslavement of Africans started in 1441, and the key person to start it was Antam Gonzalves, a Portuguese mariner. Our purpose here is to inquire one, what was Africa like just before that period? Two, what was going on there? And three, is there any surviving evidence? I work on the principle of no evidence, then it didn't happen. Okay, the Mali Empire. In 1441, West Africa was dominated by the Empire of Mali. It included Mali, Mauritania, Guinea, and Senegambia. These will be the modern countries on a modern map that made up the medieval empire of Mali. The empire became decadent and undisciplined, losing its 14th century position as the richest state in the world, says the BBC. It was still impressive, however. In particular, they had 400 cities and large towns, where two were particularly important, Timbuktu and Gao. So if we take a look at the map, here we have it. There's Timbuktu, there's Gao. And then the political capital was this one here, Niani. Timbuktu, what do we know about this city? It had spacious houses built of clay bricks, wood and plaster. It had three famous temples whose minarets dominated the Timbuktu skyline. These temples were the Jingwenabira Mosque, built by Mansa Musa I, some say 1326. The Sankore University Mosque, in which 25,000 students studied. And finally, the Oratory of Sidi Yahya. Now, if we could see the Jingwerabira Mosque, it would give us a picture of 14th century African architecture. And here we have it. The monument, as we can see, grand, impressive, and it looks something like a castle. So what do we know about Timbuktu? It had 150 Quran schools in which 20,000 children were instructed. It had a total city population of 115,000 people, which is incidentally five times bigger than medieval London. One early visitor to the city, Leo Africanus, wrote, he saw numerous judges, doctors, and clerics all receiving good salaries from the king. He also observed that more profit is made from the book trade than any other line of business. Now, do these books still exist? Can we see some of these books? What would it tell us about early Africa? Well, National Geographic says that 700,000 of these manuscripts still exist. 
Many of these literary treasures are in Arabic, the main language of scholarship in medieval Africa, just like Latin was the main language of scholarship in medieval Europe. Others are in local languages such as Songhai and Mandinka and so on. Now, can we see one of these manuscripts for ourselves? Because if we can, it will give us a picture of the kind of writings that Africans used to do. And here we have an image. Again, all of these images you can find in our book before the slave trade. What was going on in the Yoruba kingdoms before the slave trade? Here we have a map of the Nigeria region. And southwest Nigeria is the Yoruba territories. And the key city here is Ile Ife. Another name for this city is Ife. And that was the center of Yoruba culture in medieval times. One author wrote, it is impossible to describe here all the riches of the civilization of Ife. And that scholar who was stumped for things to say because there was too much to say was the great professor Sheikh Anta Diop. All right, can we see for ourselves? These splendid metal heads were discovered after 1906. Perfectly naturalistic, made of several metals worked together. This is medieval art. Art made somewhere between 1100 and 1500 AD. And here we have one of those. We've got a detail where we can see how finely executed the work is. This is the finest metal art of the Middle Ages. Okay, what was going on in Ethiopia before the slave trade? Well, in Ethiopia region was the empire of Abyssinia. Its 12th and 13th century religious capital remains astonishing. This is what an Englishman had to say, Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. He said Ethiopia contains the most remarkable churches in the world. He went on to say, that they certainly deserve to be reckoned with the seven wonders of the world. This is because all who have seen them marvel, not at their beauty, but at the mind of the man who conceived their design and the colossal labor which was expended in their making. Okay, so what happened? Emperor Lalibela had a city built in Ethiopia where nearly all the monuments are underground. And Essentially, his dream seems to have been the creation of a new Jerusalem in Ethiopia. Consequently, Lalibela has a River Jordan, has a Calvary, has a Mount of Transfiguration, has a church called Golgotha, and has another church called Bethlehem. Now, can we see this for ourselves? Now, check out this photograph we have here. This is ground level, that's ground level, the top of that church is ground level, the top of this church is ground level. This church here is called the Church of the Redeemer of the World. And as you can see, this is now being cut out of the ground to a depth of 11 and a half meters. Here we have the Church of Mary cut into the ground to a depth of 10 and a half meters. Essentially, they drilled these buildings out of the ground. Okay, now if we can get another image here, what we will see here is another image where we can see the top, ground level, ground level, top of the church, and then inside that same church, all of this used to be mounted site, all of this has been carved out and sculpted by the Ethiopian architects who built this in the 12th and 13th centuries. Absolutely astonishing. Not only that, Ethiopia is rich in inscriptions and manuscripts. There are uh, inscriptions going back to 500 BC written in Proto-Ethiopic. Now it's controversial. Some people say the script isn't Ethiopic, they say it's Sabean. Others say it's not Sabean, it's Proto-Ethiopic. So I'm going to split the difference and call it Proto-Ethiopic Sabean. Later inscriptions are in Ethiopic and also in Greek. But even the Greek ones were written by Africans. There are gold, silver, and bronze coins with Ethiopic and Greek legends. And we have thousands of Ethiopic manuscripts that have survived, the earliest dating from the 10th century AD. 250,000 of these manuscripts exist, 
and 12,000 of these texts have been microfilmed or catalogued by scholars. Okay, now can we see one of these manuscripts? Well, here's a 15th century manuscript, and it's based on the Song of Solomon, and you can see the writing in the beautiful Ethiopic script. And this is the same script that has been versioned by the Eastern Europeans and turned into the Armenian script and the Georgian script. But let's be quite clear, Ethiopic is its parent. Now, let me talk about our final topic, which is the book before the slave trade. I see this book as an indispensable teaching and learning tool for the understanding of medieval Africa, for the understanding of ancient Egypt, for the understanding of black civilizations in early Asia, for the understanding of the African presence in early America, for the understanding of the Moors in Spain. Okay, now let me give you an example of how the book could be used. The book is very pictorial, and my view is this. How is this useful for the understanding of medieval Africa? If I was to show this image here, taken from our book. Now people will be looking at it and they'll be saying, well, wait a minute, those are castles. Africa didn't have castles. Well, that shows just how little you know. This is an Ethiopian city called Gondar, and these monuments were built in the 1600s and the 1700s. And as you can see, they're still standing, they're still impressive, and this monument here is thought to have been a library. Okay, what about this image of ancient Egypt? We can see the ancient Egyptian pharaoh. He's called Pharaoh Menkara. He's of the fourth Egyptian dynasty. But let's take a look. That face is 100% African. Now, what does this tell us about the ancient Egyptians? In fact, that face looks a little bit like Lenny Henry. Hmm. Is that possibly his great, great, great ancestor? Who knows? Here we have another ancient Egyptian pharaoh. Now, many people have said that this person looks slightly feminine, but it's actually a male. It's actually Pharaoh Akhenaten, Pharaoh of the 18th Egyptian dynasty. Here we have some ancient Egyptian dolls with very long hair. And many people looked at that hair and they said, Robin, that doesn't look very African. What's going on here? Now, the same book that had these dolls had this doll. And this doll was bought in Nubia. The Nubians are the people to the south of Egypt. And the same book had this image of this Nubian lady with her hair dressed just like this, which is just like this. So this hair is that hair going with that face. And what it tells us is not only were the early Egyptians, Africans, just like us, their modern descendants are the Nubians, just like her. Black civilizations in early Asia. Now that may come as a shock to people, but yes, there were black civilizations in early Asia. Black people did a lot of stuff. Let me show you something. Here we have a young man. Now many people looking at him would think, oh, he's from Africa. Well, he's not actually. He's actually an indigenous Filipino. Here we have some ladies who look like they stepped straight out of East Africa, perhaps the Maasai ethnic group, something like that. Well, no, these ladies are actually indigenous people from India, showing that we have a history there too. And the book goes into that history. Okay, so let me wrap it up. This concludes our infomercial. And if you want more information, our website, www.blackhistorystudies.com. Let me wrap it up.